Facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. Today we have a wonderful guest and I'm so happy that Rabbi Michael Summer is here to help me to understand myself as well as my viewers to understand what is going on as far as anti-Semitism today. We're calling the show The Resurgence of Anti-Semitism and it is 2018. And uh, we're trying to figure out, or I'm trying to figure out, and I've talked to many other people, why today? Why is it happening? And it happened many years ago when I was growing up, where Jewish people uh, was not, you couldn't rent an apartment. You had a, a very hard time to rent an apartment to somebody that was Jewish. And now it's, it's starting all over again. And, Rabbi, I know you don't consider yourself an expert, but I consider you more of an expert than most people. You are a rabbi, and I'm really happy that you're here today. Welcome. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much for having me today. So maybe you're here to answer, and I know you're here to answer, many questions, and I wrote a few questions down, and I want, I want you to address them because I think it's very important to really understand what is happening. So maybe you need to answer this question, where do you see the resurgence of anti-Semitism in America coming from? You see a lot of sentiment uh, rising due to the perceived immigration problems. You see people feeling like they're losing their sense of national identity, like they're losing their country. And so part of that fear, um, people fall back on anti-Semitism, on there being some kind of Jewish conspiracy in the world to alter or change their lives because Jews, for the most part, historically, have always been immigrants. So you see it in the Great uh, Dispersion. Uh, when Rome destroyed the Temple in Jerusalem in 70, um, Jews are dispersed even further throughout the world. And so for centuries, we were always the stranger in countries and in cities and seen as other. And so you have a lot of that passed down historically as Jews being seen as the outsider. And so there are many within the world that still see the Jewish people as outsiders and as the cause of their problems. And they latch onto that to blame us for their lives, their problems, their governments. Even though the Jewish people as a whole throughout the world are less than a quarter percent of 1.1% population in the entire world. We're one of the smallest religious populations in the world. It's interesting because we've been here for so long in the United States, America, and um, to be blamed for, you know, say, uh, in fact, uh, the Tree of Life synagogue attack, um, you know, the Jews were uh, possibly, bl you know, blamed for, they got, you know, because they were supposedly on the side of the caravan. Uh, that was one of the reasons that was given to me when I was asking around that the caravan uh, it was Jewish people were pro because, again, we're going back to the immigration because Jewish people were immigrants at one time, but so were the Italians and so were the Irish and the Polish people. Um, why, why is it thrown back on the, the Jews? Uh, you know, uh, why, you know, first of all, I, you see, I see Jewish, maybe people see 
Jews as a national uh, nationalism or are Jewish is a religion but you know why are we given that identity why is it that you know no one else is blamed for it except the Jewish people because there were more we were, were we weren't the only immigrants around because Jews have suffered persecution throughout history we are often the loudest voice in open societies where you can protest um, a lack of equal rights or discrimination. So in America, Jews have often been to the forefront of movements towards ending some kind of discrimination. You see uh, major rabbis and Jews that march with Martin Luther King Jr. for the civil rights movement. You see us advocating for tolerance and acceptance of all lifestyles, and you see us in equality of marriage. And so anyone who sees that as a push against or a degradation of their beliefs or their religion sees the Jews as the destroyers of, their, of what they imagine America to be. Now, do you see the Jewish people, that when, you, when, they, when they criticize Israel, is Israel being criticized uh, because it's a, it's a country, uh, people are criticizing the country, or are they criticizing Jews? Uh, is anti-Semitism is anti -Semitism and anti-Israel the same, or is it separate? Part of it is the same. The anti-Israel, anti-Zionism is a, a new form of anti-Semitism where people try to say that I'm not an anti-Semite, I'm just against Israel and Israel's policies when it comes to the Palestinian people. And they create, Hezbollah and Hamas have created a, a large amount of propaganda to make the Palestinians look like the Davids of history and Israel to look like the Goliath of history. And they fail to show how much violence has come out of Palestine, how the PLO was a leading terrorist organization in the 1970s, how Israel, um, starting with the Oslo Accord, was working towards peace and working towards making sure the territories were viable for the Palestinian people. And they, it's, it's not shown in the education, like within this propaganda movement, that the Palestinian government, that uh, Hamas and Hezbollah are um, not holding up their end of the peace agreement. So you get this anti-Israel and anti-Zionist rhetoric as if where to blame for the plight of the Palestinians, and it completely avoids talking about how their government has used the people as shields. It, exactly, because we were talking today at the Bluegrass restaurant, um, my favorite restaurant, um, we were talking today about the United Nations and how they uh, they blame the uh, uh, the human rights violations in Israel. Yet China has the most human rights violations of any country. One of the most of uh, most countries is China, and of course they're not talking about China. They're not talking about Saudi Arabia that also has human rights violations and other Middle Eastern countries. Yet they continue to dwell on Israel being a apartheid nation and the BDS movement, which is boycott, divestment, and sanction Israel. And you know, ever it seems like. The Jews are always to blame. Israel is always to blame. Why is it? I mean, why can't? I mean, this is you said this happened so many years ago, and it's coming back to haunt us again. With the United Nations, you have all the Muslim countries vote as a bloc, so Israel is always cited for human rights violations, and none of the Muslim countries are cited for human rights violations or larger but countries. there's so many of them there. There's, there's so many violations, but they're not held up. So when you can have that many countries vote against one democratic country that happens to be the only Jewish country in the world where every citizen can vote, no matter what your religion, what your nationality, if you are an Israeli citizen, you have a vote, you have incredible uh, women's rights, um, and equality for all humans who are considered Israeli citizens. When you have that many countries can, that can vote against the one democratic country in the Middle East, 
they can say whatever they want. But this is hitting the United States. You by by them, uh, the United Nations and attacking Israel. I think this. Uh, this represents the Jewish people even here, and the Jewish people here are getting criticized because of that. Right. When you have the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement funded, but the sources of their funding aren't really revealed, although a lot of the sources come from outside of the country, and you have the propaganda of that movement trying to make Israel look like in such a bad, bad lighting, um, then it's all one-sided. When you have students that don't understand oh, yeah. what is that. going on and don't understand the history, as soon as you call Israel an apartheid state, it just shows that you don't understand what an apartheid state is. Israel is nothing like you know South Africa um, in the last century. And what apartheid was about, Israel is a democratic society. All we're asking for is that the Palestinian government put down all weapons and stop the violence in Israel so that we can create a real peace. But you have a country and a government that in their bylaws is the complete destruction of Israel. So you don't have a country that wants the same things as Israel, but you have a great propaganda movement that in America where the you know little country, the smaller country, the less advanced country is the victim and Israel is the aggressor. Israel is constantly seen as um, the bad country and the Palestinians are seen as the victims. Do you, you see it because here in the United States, and uh, I know my, I have grandsons that go to uh, universities, and uh, one of my grandsons pointed it out to me that it's being taught at, it was one of his, my grandson from Texas, was taught in his college, his university that he was going to, that, uh, that you know, the, you, the professors are teaching that. They're actually teaching that the Palestinians are, you know, they're being aggressed upon by Israel. They're the aggressors. And so a lot of this is being taught to our, you know, our college students. In fact, I want to point out something that um, I don't know if we can see this, but it's if you, a camera can go on this. If you can't, it's okay too. In Baraboo, Wisconsin, students giving the Nazi salute before their prom this spring, and it was all about the Wisconsin high schoolers giving the Hitler salute and the problem of ironic Nazism. And this is what happens when memory of the Holocaust fades. And it's not being taught the Holocaust, you know, what happened at the Holocaust is not being taught, yet it's being taught that Israel is the aggressor. So you're seeing students, you know, I would say there, there's many students here. There, most of them are giving the Nazi salute, some are not. But, and yet there was nothing, none of, there was not an assembly afterwards or a, a teacher or a, a superintendent of schools or a principal that, recommend, that recommended any of these students for what happened. And they, as it was said, they thought it was a joke. But really, was it a joke? Did they really understand what they were doing? Did, their, did they learn it from their parents? Or it was just something they saw on a, on a television show? You know, they've done this in a lot of these uh, comedy shows. They're putting, uh, for instance, I've, I've gotten things in the mail, on my email, as far as uh, putting Donald Trump in a Hitler uniform. So they're seeing a lot of this stuff going on today in, uh, in, in their emails or their, uh, their other accounts that they use. What do you see that's happening at the schools? And part of it, it's responsible for the anti-Semitism of today. Well, even seeing like there was uh, posters, propaganda posters put out that show the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu um, equating him with, with Hitler. And you see in a class like this that not only does it show a lack of understanding from these high school students, but the fact that they don't even understand that they're probably denigrating the memory of their grandparents or great-grandparents who fought in World War II and fought against Nazism and fascism and understanding what that was. So this, this symbol 
denigrates what their ancestors did to keep the world safe from Nazism and fascism, what um, America fought for during World War II, and it shows a complete lack of understanding. You have school systems throughout the world where the education, Holocaust education is being removed because you have Muslim communities protesting that they don't believe it should be taught in the schools. So when you make history as propaganda and you can remove how history is taught because you have a side trying to show that there's a Jewish agenda versus you're trying to show what happened during World War II and how one country singled out one people in the world and tried to eradicate them from all of Europe, um, you often don't get the history of how there were Muslim allies of the Germans that were all about um, erasing the Jews from Egypt and erasing the Jews from the Middle East, that it didn't dawn on them that, that the Nazis, if they had won, probably just would have continued with them after World War II. So you fast forward to today, and you have a lack of understanding of what the Nazi salute means, of what it means to be a neo-Nazi, and you see the movement of white supremacists um, increasing their activity and their vocalism about what they think is a Jewish agenda. Um, you hear in Charlottesville, they were chanting on the news that Jews will not replace us, that they've been taught about whatever this you know, agenda is that doesn't exist, that we're trying to replace them, which has to come from a place of being taught hatred, being taught um, anti-Semitic beliefs, being taught that, you know, in their world, whatever their pain, their suffering, that they think that, that this small percentage of people in the world actually would want to replace them, that they feel the fear of this. And you see from the, we were also talking about the left point, the, the extreme left point of view with Antiva, where they're, uh, you know, they were down there also at, in Charlottesville, and uh, they were throw, you know, throwing things on the statues, kicking them, throwing paint, whatever. They were trying to destroy. That's the opposite point of view, which um, was about, you know, their their beliefs of also the Palestinians and the and that Israel is the aggressor and uh, and. Um, and so there, they, so we had two points of view during, I think, Charlottesville. There was the right with the, you know, the Nazi um, uh, KKK representation, and then there was the left where the Antifa was representing, re represented there. That was the kids, you know, from Antifa, and they were wearing the whatever their the hoodies or whatever they they usually wear. So you you had two points of view going on. Meanwhile. Uh, they were they, they brought the statues down and for people, you know, some of the statues like I I think you mentioned that that that, uh, uh, that President Lee really didn't want a statue of himself, but you know Lee represented you know the South uh, as far as a lot of Southerners and even Southern Jewish people because I lived in the South and uh, and I and they were very pro Lee because they would say I say I would say well who didn't the North win the war and they they said absolutely not the South won the war okay so there was always that back and forth when I lived in the South they you know and, and that, this is amongst Jewish people not uh, cr just Christian people uh, believing that so when they demolished the statues you know some of the statues of the um, Confederate war it was uh, pretty devastating, maybe not to us living in the North, but people that, you know, that their grand, their grandfathers were in that, you know, in the Confederate War. So they have a history as well. But General Lee never wanted statues put up. He wanted the country to heal from the wounds of the Civil War. The statues are sort of a rewriting of history from 1900 to the 1930s. Um, Confederate War statues were, were put up. And um, so it wasn't, it was a rewriting of the war, rewriting of the history, making the South seem patriotic. Um, but, they, but they want to feel patriotic. Because if you go down there, you see all, you know, American flags, Confederate flags. You know, they have museums with uh, history, lots of history, depending on where you go in the South. There is a lot of... Uh, right, but if we're still they, fighting the Civil War in 2018, when we're supposed to be a United States of America, 
where all sitting citizens are working towards a tolerant and accepting country, and you still have a faction of Americans that don't want to be accepting and don't want to be tolerant. Um, the use of the Civil War statues that they don't know the history that that they were put up way after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if you have generally not want statues of himself, if you have someone who fought in the war, saw the worst of the war, and wanted the country to be able to heal, and that were still not healed in 2018, then you have a continuation of sort of false histories being taught to individuals who think that this nation was theirs, right? If you ask any of the First Nations the amount of pain that they suffered from the immigrants from other countries coming in and appropriating the United States of America, the United States of America was always a melting pot. Like there were always um, many different races and colors living in this country. It's, it's not the way they see it in their minds and what they've been taught with their... I guess we're still fighting a little bit of the Civil War in, in Charlottesville. I think that's probably what, what happened. Um, you know, the, the, the ones that wanted to take it down felt they, the way you're describing it and other ones, but they took it down the wrong way. What I think they should have done, maybe removed them and put them in a museum or in a, in a historical museum of some kind rather than demolish them. They were a piece of art, I mean, as far as somebody made them and casted them and was a lot of work doing them. You know, if you want to put down history instead of just you know, taking and crashing them down and, 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 and doing such damage to them, they could have been removed to a right. historical site. And I think, you know, you mentioned the anti-fascist movement um, and you mentioned them both being in Charlotte, but the, when, you, when the argument is in yelling and rhetoric, it's one thing. When it gets to violence and when you have one side drive a car into the middle of a protest and, and kill someone just because they hold opposing views, our country is supposed to be a place where you can have opposing views and it doesn't lead to violence. When you have any side getting to violence and yeah. you have one side, you know, the fascist movement, the white supremacist movement, want to get to violence because you can't, this country's not going to go back ever to a predominantly white country. Their fear of their existence, no one is really coming after their existence or their way of life, but it's mm -hmm. this fear as if the cities, the, the cities where there's such diversity and when there's a greater population um, are trying to change their lives where they live. But I, see, but I see this as younger people. It isn't our age group that's doing it. It's a, younger, it's a younger group. And I think it goes back, I think we started talking about the school system and what they're t getting taught in colleges. And I think a lot of this goes back to going back to the schools. These kids are uh, not getting taught the right thing. They're not understanding what's happening. They think, you know, taking down statues, um, protesting. Uh, I, I know we have, we have the First Amendment, which is, um, which is the First Amendment, uh, you know, that we have the right, the right to- Free speech. Free speech, mm -hmm. right, thank you. Uh, but what is free speech? Is it to hurt other people? Is it to make people feel bad about who they are? What is free speech? And I think some of these schools are not teaching, going back to Charlottesville, what are they teaching in Charlottesville? What are they teaching the students there that, that did so much damage? What are they I teaching that, What are they teaching around the, you know, the Tree of Light Synagogue and what was going around there? What is, why is it not being addressed in elementary school, high school, and especially the colleges with professors that are putting down uh, Israel? I mean, in University of California, Berkeley right now, you have a professor who's teaching how to erase Israel. And you, in Charlottesville, I'm not sure it's the, the teachers teaching it. A lot of people came in from outside of Charlottesville to protest the removal of the statue. You often have a lot of people coming from outside But they're um, younger people. Protest. They're younger people, you, you most see, of them. You see it of all age, like yes, like they're, they're young, but even the fact, I think, most of all, what a lot of these protests have shown is how much 
division there is in the country right now. And who's sponsoring this? Who's paying these people to come out? There, there are paid people that come out and protest because they get paid for it too. So who's sponsoring a lot of these these groups? You know, some of them are some of these kids are coming out by themselves because they see it happening and they're just joining. But there are a lot of paid people that are you know protesting because they're getting paid to do it, and that's not being addressed. Who's sponsoring all this, this damage and protests and, you know, uh, First Amendment screaming, yelling and, you know, tearing down different religions and faiths and, uh, you know, who's do and, and races? Who is doing this? See, that's really important to address, too, because I don't know. I personally don't know. But there are people that are doing this, probably people our age that are encouraging, you know, uh, I'm sure it's somebody that's older that's doing that, somebody that has the money to do so. Right. You probably have uh, connections to, again, Hamas and the Palestinian government. You probably have connections to Iran funding the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, the student unions that you see for Free Palestine and um, students for, for Palestine on, on the campuses that, because of that funding, like they're able to have large protests um, against Israel as well as um, control the message. And once you can take that message and spread it to people who have no idea about the history, who are just freshmen on campus or have never been to college before, and you convince them that you know the, the small country is the victim and the big country is the aggressor. Israel suffered over 400 rocket attacks in the last month. Right, right. And didn't go to war. If you know Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin fired 400 rockets into Illinois, I don't think we'd be sitting here calmly by right now mm -hmm. if any country did that. God forbid another country on any of the borders of America shot 400 rockets right. into America. It would, we would it not would, be exactly. sitting idly by. But Israel is seen as the aggressor and the anti-Israel, anti-Zionist rhetoric um, that comes across as the sort of this new anti-Semitism overlooks that. They, they blame Israel for causing those 400 rockets to be fired into Israel. Well, we have a little bit of time. What do you see happening? How can this, how can anti-Semitism uh, be addressed and so that we can start to heal from it? What do you see that we should do, what the people should do, what our country should do? What, what do you see? I don't know that you're gonna see healing for a long time. I think it has raised awareness. I think we are all aware that anti-Semitism and anti-Israel fervor is a lot worse than we thought it was. And that after the Tree of Life Synagogue shootings, um,